Hey, what's up? You're listening to the curator. Uh, here's what happened. Me and Mark were sitting outside of a. Well, I'm not going to tell you the name of the place because that would uh, that would amount to like free advertising for them. But it's a place that sells chicken products. And uh, these 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 hooligans came up to us and they robbed us of our SD cards. And so now here we are recording the podcast on Mark's phone. And I'm not going to tell you what kind of phone it is either because they didn't pay for that. So <laughs> we're just going to keep it simple. But please excuse the sound quality if uh, there's a if there's a sound quality issue. Just know that we are in dire straits and we're we're recording on this out of desperation. We're going to get it done. All right, here we go. Hello, welcome to the Curator Podcast. This is episode twenty. Hi, hello, welcome once again dear listener to the Curator Podcast. I am your host Mark Fraser and this is episode number 20. So, at the time of recording this, I have a few interviews in the bag. Usually I like to release them chronologically, with the oldest ones coming before the most recent, obviously. That's a process that I've more or less adhered to so far, with a couple of exceptions like the heavy festival interviews that I did. But this interview, I felt I had to get out as soon as possible because I knew that if I sat on it for too long, if I dwelled on it, I'd probably decide against releasing it. Not because it's a bad interview. In fact, it's actually a really, really good interview. But because the sound quality of the interview itself isn't up to my usual standard. On this episode, I have Slug from Atmosphere. Now this guy is a pretty huge deal for me. On the last episode, I spoke briefly about how I got into hip-hop and how that led me to finding B. Dolan, who was on the last episode. Back in 2005, after a friend turned me on to my first ever indie hip-hop record, that was Sage Francis's A Healthy Distrust, I became obsessed with rap music. I spent a long time combing the internet for stuff, and eventually I came across You Can't Imagine How Much Fun We're Having. By atmosphere. It really helped me solidify my newfound love for hip hop and it's a record that I still adore to this day. So that's why this interview is a pretty big deal for me. But this interview almost didn't happen. As I started to get my gear ready to record this interview, I realised that I'd forgotten my SD card for my recorder. So in that moment I had to tell Slug that I couldn't do the interview and frankly at the time I was gutted. He then suggested that I use my phone and I was reluctant to do this for two reasons. One, of all the comments that I've had about this podcast, the most prevalent one has been about how good the sound quality is, which is kind of weird to me because I think, in fact, I know it could be a lot better and I'm working on that. So at the time, I just knew that using my phone would lead to a drop in quality. And also the second reason was that my questions were on my phone. In the end though, we went down the road of using my phone and as I was sitting there across from this rapper who I have a great amount of admiration for, I frantically tried to remember the questions that I'd written down. What transpired was a chat which actually goes pretty deep on creativity and Slug's creative process. I don't really want to say any more than that because it will ruin the episode, but it's definitely good stuff. I'm going to open this with a favourite song from the aforementioned Atmosphere record, and this is called Pour Me Another. I chase a fantasy, swerving through the galaxy, searching for a family, happily surrounded 
by planets and stars. She was stuck uptown, you was landing on Mars. It's all fucked up now, caught your hand in the jar. Another small step back, put that man in the bar. Spill a little bit of blood on the street for love that goes to those that know that they drink too much. And hold your own glass up to the heavens. Take a little time and try to count the seconds it goes. Pour me another, so I can forget you now. Pour me another, so I can forget you now. Pour me another, so I can remember how true that I am to this addiction of you now. Pour me another, so I can forget you now. Pour me another, so I can forget you now. Pour me another, so I can remember how true that I am to this addiction of you. Drink it all away, numb it down to none. Stay awake tonight and wait for the sun. You say you hate your life, you ain't the only one. Let your frustration out the gate and watch the pony run. One double for the hunger and the struggle. Two for the fool trying to pull apart the puzzle. Three, now I smile while I wait for your rebuttal. By the fourth shot, I'm just another child in a bubble. Trying to play with the passion and the placement. Just to see what these people let them get away with. Still trying to climb a mountain for you. Hammer in my hand, still pounding on a screw. She don't listen, so he don't speak no more. Nobody's winning, cause neither is keeping score. Don't want to think no more, just let me drink some Let's begin. Um, it's recording. Awesome. Sean. Hey. It's very nice to meet you. Likewise. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm okay, man. I need a nap. Uh, a long one, like four or five weeks. I need a hibernation period, <laughs> like a like a true woodland creature. Do you often hibernate when you're back home in the cold, windy city of Indianapolis, of Minneapolis? <laughs> I, I, I would if I could, you know. I don't get to. When I'm home, I'm actually busier than... Than when I'm on the road. Yeah. I, I actually get more sleep on the road than I do at home. That's why you sleep. Why, why is that? Because I have kids. Yeah. Yeah. I have 5,000 children. <laughs> and they all are hungry and they're just always screaming at me and shit. So I, I do my best to keep them fed and warm. In which case that means, you know, no sleep for dad. So the first question I have for you, 
from the top of my head since we've had a small issue with SD cards is um, I was looking online and Rhyme Sayers is 20 years old this year, man. Yeah, it's almost old enough to drink. You gotta be 21 to drink in my country, so one more year and then we can buy Rhyme Sayers a shot of whiskey. Did you ever, like, I'm not gonna ask did you ever question because you probably didn't ever think it would be what it's become, but do you ever sit and contemplate, like, it's been a quite a, a big blueprint for not only like hip hop indie labels generally, but also quality of artists. Is that something you ever sit back and contemplate? Uh, not yet, you know. I don't spend a lot of time. You know, I stay pretty focused on me. Or maybe that's not how I should say it. I stay I stay focused on whatever I'm working on or dealing with, or what's kind of in my immediate area you know and so a lot of times that's that's just my circle of friends and and what we're working on I feel like when you um if you spend time kind of looking at your achievements that's time that you're taking away from getting something else accomplished you know uh and I guess I've always kind of been like that now that's not to say that there aren't people who try to remind me all the time that things that we've done have made an impact or left an imprint but I just don't know if that's necessarily my that's not for me that's not that's not for me to think about or for me to look at I can let other people deal with that you know I would I would rather focus on whatever it is that we're working on next you know it's the same with uh you know with with my art with my music you know once we put out some music I move on I don't spend a lot of time looking backwards even at you know immediate releases you know it's like the minute we get a record out I'm ready to start working on the next one because that's what I know how to do you know well I guess a couple of questions that now spring to mind is when it comes to focusing on the next record and moving on um, I've the reason that this is such a big deal for me is because I interviewed B Dolan recently yeah. And um, I saw that after after I spoke to him and I wrote the blog post to go along with the podcast. Um, I was reflecting on how I got into hip hop, and it took me back to 2005 and it took me back to Healthy Distrust by Sage Francis. And you can't imagine how much fun you're having, obviously by yourself. And that's kind of why this is such a big deal for me. Um, but it's been 10 years since that came out, and you've evolved a great deal as an artist in that time. Songs are now much more introspective than they've ever been, um, and they kind of deal with different, completely different themes almost, but also kind of the same themes. Um, do you ever reflect on your art and think how much you've changed, or is, is that even a conscious thing, or is it just where I am just now in life, art reflects that? You know, I, I, I have a suspicion that the things haven't changed as much as they probably should have. I feel that what changes is the listener. And if the listener, you know, if you're given the opportunity to to have listeners grow with you, what really is happening is that, you know, as a listener or as a consumer or as somebody who is who is consuming art, you know, 10 years is a long time. And it's easy to look at something and go, you know, it's more introspective now but when I think about maybe my most introspective work um, a lot of it I do feel like comes through in the form of uh, when I'm dealing with issues that are really close to me mostly familial stuff family things and and every record I feel like has a little bit too much information on it like I'm given a little bit too much you know, it's almost, it, it becomes uh, somewhat of a, a task to almost withhold sometimes because you don't want to burden a project with too much personal stuff. And, and, and you want people to be able to relate to what you're doing, but you also want to leave your own fingerprint on it so that it's yours. I, I don't know. I, I have this weird feeling that when I'm dead, people are going to say he made the same fucking record over and over and over. It's hard to see it right now because we're watching its growth right now. But once it's not growing anymore and we have a chance to just kind of see it all for what it is, I'm 
I'm fearful that it's just going to be the same record over and over. You know, there was one record, the Lemons record, where I made a conscious effort to kind of give these 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 fictitious narratives and, and not lies, but stories that, you know, of 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 people that I made up. Um, and people said, this is your most personal record ever, you know, and, and so it's like. I don't really know if there's a real yes, no, right, wrong to any of it. You know, I just kind of feel like whatever you let out of your head, you have no control over how people are going to. I don't think that I answered your question. I think I managed to totally not answer your question. I think you gave an, I actually think you have a great, a great answer to that okay, question. Okay, cool. um, but it did make me wonder when you were saying that. It's, it's like, well, I mean, art is the ultimate, ref- art, art is the, as I'm sure listeners of the podcast have now cottoned on, one of the big things I keep saying is that art is one of the most selfish things you can do. So is it, is it actually ever going to be a problem if, if it does turn out somehow that you've made the same record over and over again? You're still being you and you're still doing you. Do you, you know what I mean? Yeah, I guess that, you know, it would depend on the perspective. I feel like art when 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 you're creating it it is a very selfish thing but when you get into the world of commerce and selling it you have to break that wall down and i sell art you know i don't make art on the side and fix cars for a living you know i fix cars on the side and i make art for a living and so there's a line you have to walk when you are selling art, you know, you have to, you have to embrace the fact that you're selling out or selling in, depending on how you want to look at it, but you are, you are taking the thoughts that you had or the, the ideas you had and you are wrapping them up, you're gift wrapping them and putting them in front of people, hoping that they'll pick yours. Um, in which case, that's where you have to draw a line at your own selfishness. You have to be able to, uh, you have to be able to learn how to sometimes let go of how you feel about a certain song or how you feel about an album or a photograph or a a painting or whatever um, for what might be the greater good. Now, the greater good could be to pay your phone bill or buy groceries, or the greater good could be to challenge the listener or the viewer or the greater good could be just trying to communicate something to a group of people so that we can feel some sort of community. You know, there, there are so many different reasons as to why we all consume this stuff and why we appreciate it. But at the end of the day, if you're selling it, you still have a responsibility to, um, or at least I hope that we all feel the responsibility to make sure that that nobody feels like we <laughs> manipulated them into purchasing it. You know, I don't want to walk away from a show or away from a new record feeling as though I tricked somebody mm-hmm. into listening to my shit. You know what I mean? It's like, I want you to come to it on your own terms. So therefore, even though maybe the raw footage of what I'm creating came from somewhere deep inside of me, I do know that if we don't turn my vocals down a little bit and if we don't EQ it and if we don't, you know, uh, put gates on the snares and and things of that nature, it might not be as appealing to the person that we want to hear it, you know? And so it's a, it's a, music especially is a very, it's a very interesting business. It's a very interesting, this, selling this type of art, there's, there's a lot of rules and parameters that we learn how to work within in order to, you know, in order to make it unoffensive to your ears. And so you're not flinching every time the snare hits, you know? So many questions after you said that now. Um, I suppose the most pertinent one in my head at the moment is, does the art you create reflect the art you consume? Do you create the art that you would like to consume yourself, I guess? I think for me, yeah. Um, when I'm working on something, I am ultimately trying to get it to reach a point where I accept it as a song. Um, and so, yeah, ultimately, I guess I am trying to create 
music that I want to listen to, which is ironic because once I'm done creating it, I don't ever want to fucking hear it again, you know? And so, uh, you know, I, I have like somewhat of a generic answer to that that I've said before, but it's not really as generic as it sounds. And that is, I just, I'm slowly trying to teach myself how to write the perfect song so that hopefully before I die, I will achieve what I consider to be the perfect song. Now, does that mean anybody else would consider it that? You know, and, and, and not only that, but where's the baseline for that? What does that mean? You know, for me, the perfect song is, um, you know, the majority of the stuff on uh, Stevie Wonder's songs in the Kia Life, or, you know, Billy Joel might have one or two perfect songs. I think there might be one perfect Metallica song. There might be, a, there's, a, there's a handful of perfect Michael Jackson songs. There's like five perfect Prince songs. If I could get one, then I will feel as if, you know, whatever I sat here and struggled with, I, I achieved it, you know? I put it to you then, um, if you wrote that a perfect song, would you necessarily know it? You're just, you're just trying to wreck my whole <laughs> thing here. <laughs> uh, I hope I would know it, you know? I do think I would know it. I think Prince knows it, but Prince is a special guy. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I, th I think I would know it. I think I would know it. I know when I come close, you know, I've come close twice. Um, I think I would know it, yeah. So striving to get to that, is, is that, is that what kind of gets you out of bed in the morning? Is, is trying to get close to that? Is that why atmosphere is still atmosphere? Is it trying to get to that perfect song? Is that one of the main reasons why you, why you do it? I mean, I don't know if it's one of the main reasons, but it is one of the reasons. You know, there are so many reasons why we still do this. But I would say the main reason that we still do this is because people still let us do it. You know, I we think... We fucking love you doing it, man. You, <laughs> you keep doing it forever. I, I, feel, I feel like, I feel like uh, we'll probably do it for as long as people let us. You know, people will always say, oh, I'm going to do this until it's not fun. And once it's not fun anymore, I'm going to quit. And to me, that's bullshit because this isn't fun. It's sometimes fun, but other times it's a curse. It's, it's a love-hate relationship. Like, I don't... Anytime that you become dependent on something, you also will learn how to um, resent it. And, you know, whether that, like, parents or, or, or a job or anything that you're dependent on, you also learn how to build resentment. And so, you know, I am dependent on making music. And I have also learned to resent it. But I am... I embrace that. I know that that's a part of it. And so to me, it doesn't, it doesn't veer me off. It, it's actually just part of my relationship with it, you know? It's a very pragmatic way of looking at it, I think. I mean, I, I guess, yeah. I, I always just kind of felt like it was a, just a very um, honest way of looking at it, you know, just to keep it. I want to stay as in touch with what I do as possible. I've never been one to allow myself to get gassed up or let my head go in the clouds. Just because people might like a song or two that I've made, I've, I, I, that has no bearing on how I see myself. You know what I mean? Like, much like I'm willing to bet that, you know, just because I look at a certain athlete or a certain musician or, or maybe I admire an actor for what he or she is able to do, that has no bearing on how that person sees themselves. You know what I mean? Like, it's validating to know people enjoy what you do, but I don't think that you can eat that validation. I don't think you could... You, I, you can't subscribe to that. You can't, you can't allow that to be a part of you. That's, that belongs to the person who appreciates it. A couple of things that you've said, Mimi, kind of want to round back to the question, which is kind of what this podcast is about, and it's about passion, really, and... Does passion keep you going and doing this? And is passion... I, I, one, another reason I ask that is because I have also, or also kind of do run a, record, a, small, a very small record label in Glasgow. And doing a record label was born out of one, one of two things, or perhaps two of two things, is a, a way for you to get your music out there with control completely for yourself, so that nobody fucks you over, and also for the passion of other music and helping other people get out there. So I'm asking really... Is passion one of the reasons why atmosphere is still a thing? And is passion what powers rhyme series? 
I would say, yeah, uh, passion is a, another element that I think is very important to atmosphere and rhyme series, respectively. Um, you know, for for atmosphere, we've we're you know me and Anthony have been together for twenty years now, and I look and and I think of some of my idols and heroes who didn't get to make music for twenty years, much less make music with the same crew for 20 years you know and so the passion evolves it's not the same passion as before before my passion for making music when I was younger it came from needing to be recognized my passion my hunger my desires were from I needed recognition I uh I I I wanted recognition from other artists from women I wanted recognition from I wanted fans. Uh, I wanted some money. I was broke. I, I grew up very poor. I grew up... Uh, I had no hopes of being a college student who was going to end up with a profession. You know, I was destined to end up being a truck driver or a, a mechanic or, or something that I could learn on my own without having to spend that money. And, and I was ready for that, you know? And then when somebody showed me I could make money off music, hunger came from that, passion came from that. Now now that I make money from music and now that I've achieved some recognition and the passion changes, the desires change, the hunger changes. And so those aren't the things I'm going for anymore. Now, like I said, one of my passions is I want to figure out how to write the perfect song. Another passion is, you know, of all the things that I could do with my time, I don't enjoy anything as much as I enjoy doing this, you know? And so when I have free time, I don't play video games. I don't golf. I don't cook. I don't sew. I don't, you know, I go down into my basement. Do they have basements here? Yeah. Okay. I go down to my basement. Well, I wouldn't just that. Some places don't, you know what <laughs> I mean? I go down to my basement and I, I fucking write songs, you know? Uh, I write songs. I write until way late at night, even though my kids are gonna make me wake up way early in the morning. Um, I, I get no sleep. I don't eat right. I drink too much coffee. Um, I live as unhealthy as you could live at my age, responsibly, <laughs> because of my desire to write songs. I'm gonna make a huge leap here, and you can tell me if I'm talking shit, but I'm a massive Prince fan, and that's very similar. To how he operates as well. I mean, I'm a huge Prince fan. I got to imagine, though, that if he operates like this, he, he does it on a much higher level. <laughs> and he probably has people bringing him food, you know, like in the studio. You know, I'm just sitting on a laptop on a garage band app. You know what I mean? He's sitting in probably a huge studio behind a mix board. And, but yeah, it's, it's, still, it's still the same thing. It's still the same kernel, though, of, of push, of passion, of drive to make you want to keep doing that, even when even when it's driving you insane, because no doubt you'll sit down and write a song and it fucking drives you insane that you can't get that hook or that beat or that line right, you know? Right, right. Well, you know, <laughs> to be fair, when I was a kid, I wanted to be Prince. You know, he was... I still want to be Prince. He was, he was definitely one of my idols as a, as a child. All the way up until the Batman record. <laughs> What's wrong with that record? That record is <laughs> really hard to listen to. It's yeah. probably so genius that it's hard to listen to. How about we just we just leave it like that? I'm going to agree with you. <laughs> Sean, it's been an absolute pleasure. Is there anything else you want to say or anything you want to ask me before we wrap this up? Um, oh, man, I don't know. Thank you for taking the time to come all the way up here and ask questions. Um, who's your next interview? Who you got lined up next? Um, I've got some local guys lined up next, a uh, sort of emo band called The Sinking Feeling. I mean, like 90s emo sort of oh, thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, they are really interesting, and I'm looking forward to talking to them. All right. Thank you very much, man. Thank you. Cheers. It wasn't until afterwards when I left the venue and I was looking through my phone that I realised that I had a whole bunch of questions that I wanted to ask that I just didn't ask in the interview. Also, because of all the messing about with the recorder and trying to get a way to record it and stuff like that. It took a little while to get the interview going. So the interview is actually shorter than I would have liked. But you know, sometimes these things happen and it's total, like I've, I've said it before, I'll keep saying it. 
I've got no idea what I'm doing. This is total seat of the pants stuff. I think that interview is probably the biggest example of that. But I wonder, is there anything more more unprofessional than rolling up to an interview for a podcast without a spare SD card and then having to use your phone? I don't think there is. I usually carry a spare everything in my bag, a spare microphone, spare cables, spare batteries even. And now, after that interview... A spare SD card, just in case I forget. I feel a bit silly. But you know what? The interview turned out really fucking well, and I'm glad that I didn't just leave, because I was ready to leave. I was ready to get up and walk out, but I didn't. And what turned out was a pretty good interview. And plus, the sound quality isn't too bad. You can actually hear everything, so, you know. Anyway, I'm going to shut up about this. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure, as always. I hope you enjoyed it. Please drop me a rating and review on iTunes if you can. That's really super massively mega important to me. And I want to get up those iTunes charts because I want people to listen to this because I think that you you like it, so other people are going to like it too, and that would be awesome. So I'm going to play you out now with a song from Atmosphere's latest album called Southsiders, and this song is called Fortunate. Thank you for listening. Until next time, bye-bye. I'd like to make a suggestion, see If everybody on this comet agreed We could set the clock to whenever we want it to be I just might just modify the mileage I don't know much, but I'm confident the fight's fixed So high that I feel like a pilot Falling out of sky full of brilliant brightness <laughs> Hurry up, stir me up You gotta learn the words before the whole earth burning But we wouldn't even need to recognize your birthday If you were the center of the universe in the first place If I had feathers, I would fly away If I felt fresher and fur, I would hibernate If I ever figured out how to communicate Maybe then we could accumulate For now, face the wall, I ain't the same as y'all A real friend wouldn't make you take the fall Sometimes life would try to break your balls With a long list of missed wake-up calls Carrying a big stuffed animal I'm trying not to make a mess though Gotta stay sensible Ain't nobody coming with the antidote I wanna watch you grow And I wanna leave the planet better off Than it was handed to me And I don't know there's a possibility So I settle for selling my soul To the slaves of the land of the free I don't wanna leave my family tree behind I don't want no one to miss me Like I miss you But I don't want to take up too much time I'm not trying to run away from the line we drew The sunshine seems to feel so seamless The soldier is a dreamer and a realist And history sealed this Taught me that a hero ain't nothing but a field trip Nah, I know you're down to do something profound Put a stick in the ground to prove that you was around But no amount of time would ever be considered enough I'm trying to tether it up and live forever through love We're not lucky, but we're fortunate. I'm pretty sure of it. And all the life we wasted trying to make some bread might have been better spent trying to raise the dead.